This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, April 10th, 2014. I'm Tom Merritt, and I'm not here right now. I'm probably, who knows where I am when you're listening to this, but uh, I am at uh, the Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville this day giving a talk. Uh, so we're doing a news from you episode, and thanks you, thanks you, thanks you to everybody who sent in uh, missives, sent in emails, send in recordings. We got some friends of the show did it. We got some great listener contributions. And I'm going to start off, though, as I normally do, with the headlines. BlackBerry CEO John Chen told Reuters, if I cannot make money on handsets, I will not be in the handset business, which led headline writers to declare BlackBerry would dump handsets. You might understand that. So Chen wrote a blog post Thursday that said, I want to assure you that I have no intention of selling off or abandoning this business anytime soon, referring to the devices business. So what gives? Well, it's pretty easy if you think about it. Chen said, he won't stop making devices soon, but if he can't make money off it eventually, he'll get out of the business. Stop saying reasonable things, John Chen. It confuses everyone. Hey, does hearing more about Heartbleed's vulnerability make your brain bleed? Well, last pass to the rescue. The password storage and checker won points for fixing the vulnerability on their own site quickly and for the solid practice of encrypting traffic on another level. Now, LastPass users have a handy tool to help them decide if and when to change passwords due to Heartbleed. The security checker function in LastPass uh, will scan all your stored passwords and highlight any servers that have not patched OpenSSL 1.01, plus whether they've updated their security certificate. It's all summarized in an action entry that either says wait or go update. Well done, LastPass. You know, they don't pay us to say these things. We just really like them. TechCrunch reports Google's Advanced Technology and Projects Group has released a module developers kit for Project Aura. That's the modular smartphone project. That means hardware developers can now start working on modules that would fit into that Google-made endoskeleton, let's just swap things in and out. Without independent companies making lots of modules, Project Aria wouldn't be very interesting. So go get them, developers. TechCrunch also reports Facebook is taking the messaging capability out of the standard Facebook app. That means you'll need to download the Facebook Messenger app separately if you want to chat with friends on the service while you're on your mobile device. People who have already downloaded the separate Messenger app might not notice this since the Messenger tab has automatically been detecting whether the Messenger app was there or not and then linking to that if it is. Facebook will roll the change out slowly starting in Europe and they'll notify users several times before the messaging tab actually disappears. The change doesn't affect users of Facebook's paper app. Remember, Comcast submitted that huge hundred-so-plus page filing on why a merger with Time Warner Cable would be good. Among the many reasons Comcast pointed out, they don't compete with Time Warner Cable in any market because they don't overlap. Well, CNET reports Senator Al Franken found that interesting. During a U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee hearing on the merger, Senator Franken pointed out Comcast cited competition with Time Warner Cable as a reason to approve Comcast's acquisition of NBC Universal back in 2010. Uh, the hearing does not have any direct influence over approval of the merger. The Dropbox-owned Mailbox app is now available for Android users, and Gadget reports it even has some new features not found in the iOS version, including Auto Swipe that teaches the app which emails you archive and defer until later and acts upon them automatically when it sees them. The company also showed off a preview of Mailbox for the desktop. Dropbox also made news with the addition of Dr. Condoleezza Rice to its board of directors. PC Magazine reports that Dropbox CEO Drew Houston made the announcement, along with the news that Sujay Jaswa and Dennis Woodside have been named CFO and COO, respectively. Rice, in her past, has been provost of Stanford University, served on the board of several companies like HP and Charles Schwab, and is likely best known for her service as U.S. Secretary of State under President George W. Bush. However, before that, don't forget, Rice was also National Security Advisor for President Bush from 2002 until 2005. That does not mean she was in charge of the NSA. It's an advisory White House position that didn't have any authority over any single department. But that is causing a lot of discussion on the internet, as you could imagine. All right, we've got some great submissions from a bunch of you out there. Thank you. Let's bring on our guests, Toby Pinder, Justin Kroll, David Broadbeck, Richard Ya, Demon, Guillaume, Ken Kate Bab, Tex Jeb, and more. After DTNS wrapped up on Tuesday, there was a post-show discussion about Hartley that I personally found fascinating. 
centered around how exactly a person is supposed to explain these kind of security issues to friends and family who might not have technical or security backgrounds. Waiting it out for sites to email or notify users via alternative channels just opens a giant vector of phishing attack with fake people emailing you for password resets, which I'm honestly surprised I haven't heard of yet. And just waiting it out, spending three days offline? That risks users being unaware that their credentials are being abused. So this next week is going to be a period in which I can't really see a right answer outside of carefully tabbing between SSL labs tests and normal websites, something which can't really be expected of all but the most technical users. But the real story is what will the landscape be like in a month from now, as embedded devices, abandoned servers and the general long tail of the internet keeps handing out its secrets in 64 kilobyte chunks. Time will tell, I guess. Hey Tom, it's Rich DeMuro, tech reporter at KCLA TV in Los Angeles. Love what you're doing with the show. Just wanted to give you my two cents on the whole Dropbox, Mailbox, all that good stuff they announced with Carousel and the app being available for Android and soon the desktop. I think it's a good step in the right direction for Mailbox. I think it's great that you can uh, download the app to your desktop computer, which I think is really neat. One of my favorite email management apps is called Cloud Magic, and I've been bugging them to get that on the desktop because once you have the power of that, uh, all of your emails in one place and easily searchable in the cloud, it's really fun. Um, and, of course, that one supports Exchange, which I really like. As for Carousel, um, I'm using Dropbox for all of my pictures now. I store them in there. I dump them basically into the Dropbox. I love how it organizes them into that timeline on the, on the desktop, on the website. Um, but I also love having access to all of my Dropbox pictures pictures on my phone. And plus, I share my Dropbox with my wife, so she has access to all the pictures I take on my phone instantly, which is kind of scary sometimes. And then she, I have the same access to the pictures she takes on her phone, so it's great for sharing pictures of the kids. Anyway, I uh, love to see these companies innovating like this. Uh, Dropbox is really filling it, it seems. So I'm uh, looking forward to trying out Carousel, which is their new standalone photo app for the uh, iPhone and Android. All right, keep up the good work on Daily Tech News Show. Bye-bye. Hi, Tom and Jenny and all the DTNS listeners out there. I am a video editor and producer out of New York City, and I just have a few things to talk about regarding the Adobe Creative Cloud debate that still seems to be raging. If you'll remember about a year or so ago, Adobe switched to an entirely subscription-based plan for its entire creative suite, now known as the Creative Cloud. Both sides of the debate have matured to some degree, and a lot of people have come to accept the subscription model, but a lot of people are still upset. From Adobe's side, they've shown that they can release more usability updates as opposed to just adding in new features without being able to address bugs that have cropped up. From the other side of the argument, complaints continue to be that if you create files in Premiere or After Effects or any of the other Adobe Creative Cloud software titles, you will more or less be locked into those titles unless you export XMLs or some sort of transitional file that will work with other software titles. Hi, Don Dave from Allen, Texas. Uh... Under the things that make you say, hmm, regarding Fitbit and iWatch and some of the other technology uh, news that's been going on lately, just some things were connecting in my head, uh, pun intended. Uh, you think about the fact that Apple purchased the makers of their original Kinect sensor. Remember, the, the Kinect sensor can pick up things like heart rate and other information we're not completely sure to what level of detail but it is a very capable sensor and uh, apple has been doing medical research and uh, as far as instrumentation and those sort of things and everyone in the hospital if you think about it is wearing some sort of bracelet always have a bracelet that has information they come in to give a medicine they ask people and verify information birth date that sort of thing yeah, combine this with the fact that periodically they come through and take vital signs, uh, blood pressure, temperature, respiration, these sort of things. Now, take a Kinect sensor, and the majority of doctors and nurses and such like that are using some sort of iPhone or iPad device. Put a Kinect sensor in the room and have some sort of sensor on their wrist as part of the bracelet, and you have a nice combining of information making it all seamless and easy to get to, which is kind of what Apple does. Just an interesting thought thought you might like to, to share. Take care. Keep up the great work. 
Hey Tom, Dave Broadbeck here at D Broadbeck on Twitter. The other day I bought uh, a couple of Blu-ray movies for my son for his birthday. They came with digital copies. First time I've ever used Ultraviolet. Everything else we've got so far has the, the iTunes download. I wanted to watch the digital copies uh, on my iPad, no problem, using Flixster and Ultraviolet. Tried uh, slinging it over to the uh, Apple TV using AirPlay. It didn't work. Uh, I imagine this is Apple's fault or it's... I, I, I don't care whose fault it is. I just want to watch stuff. So it's very frustrating and I wish these people would all just get together and realize that I don't want to steal stuff. I want to actually watch what I want, when I want. Wait a second, wrong show. Anyway, uh, if you find things like that interesting, like my opinion there, why not turn in the best episode ever at bestepisodeever.com or the Marshall McLuhan Variety Hour at mmbh.ca. Oh yeah, broken-area.com. I've got a few podcasts. Thanks a lot. Hey Tom, this is Rich from lovely Cleveland. And one of the stories that I think hasn't really been commented on was the announcement a few weeks ago that partners using ARM chips have uh, shipped a cumulative 10 billion chips uh, in 2013. To put this into context, that accounts for about 20% of all ARM uh, chips partners have shipped since 1991. Not too surprising considering how uh, the mobile market has exploded in the past seven years. This is the first time that I have seen the sheer number reported. While the smartphone market may be approaching the saturation point, there seems to be plenty of areas for growth for chip designers using ARM's design. In enterprise, we're seeing the beginnings of ARM-based servers, and uh, which could be a huge growth sector and a potential goldmine for chip makers who traditionally uh, lived on very slight margins for ARM chips. Uh, also, the potential emergence of a wearable market uh, would be another avenue for continued expansion. Just as 10 years ago, the traditional Wintel partnership looked untouchable in consumer computing, ARM seems set up to have their designs in nearly every market segment with no signs of letting up. This is Rich from Lovely Cleveland, signing out. Hello, Tom. This is Richard John. I want to bring up a point regarding the Facebook acquisition of Oculus. I saw a lot of people trying to figure out how Oculus would be integrated into Facebook or how and why it was such a monumental device for the future of mankind that it was too good to pass up at $2 billion. Um, everyone was basically trying to figure out Mark Zuckerberg's strategy. Uh, I had an alternate theory. I think that Mark Zuckerberg was a good or great coder and designed a beautiful social network, uh, much nicer than Friendster, Friendster and MySpace, and his version did become dominant. But just like the, no one's hopping over fences to find out what the CEOs of Friendster and MySpace thought about the future and of tech and where we're going, I don't think that Mark Zuckerberg is any more qualified than they are. And I don't want to be mean, but I think if you give a 28-year-old billions of dollars and you surround him by yes-men, he's bound to get in trouble and make some bad decisions. And when, when Google had their two young CEOs come on, sorry, two young founders, they, they made sure to put in Eric Schmidt to uh, keep an eye on them. And I think maybe we're seeing that Facebook should have had the same policy in place. Peace and love. Peace and love. Hey, Tom, it's Molly. I, um, listen, I'm kind of calling to say goodbye forever because I'm getting off the internet. This heart bleed thing, I can't take it anymore. This is like the last straw. I don't, it's just going to get worse from here. You know it is. We're all so interconnected and nobody seems to be paying attention to their code anymore. And so then this bug comes out. It's been out for two years and who knows how long people have known about it. And even if they found out yesterday, they were able to slurp up more information than you can almost even imagine with relative ease, I might add. And then even if patches are applied to sites, the certificate issuers are still ha like arguing about who's responsible for updating certificates, whether it's paying customers or the certificate authorities themselves. And the whole thing is just a disaster of epic proportions. And have we talked about how annoying it is to change passwords all the time? Like LastPass, pretty good, but has some serious interface problems. And overall, like, I don't understand why the password even still exists and why we're still having to mess around with that kind of thing. And honestly, changing passwords at this point is like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic after there's a big hole blown in the bottom or like changing the locks after you had a big break in. It might make you feel a little bit better, but all it's really going to do is take four hours or more of your time during tax season. Anyway, I hope you're having a nice day and um, I've enjoyed being on the show. Okay, bye. According to an article on The Verge, airlines are moving more of their customer service agents from the phones 
to Twitter, where they're able to handle more customer service inquiries much more quickly. Now let's face it, there are some things that are said over Twitter that would not have been done to a customer service rep over the phone. There are also issues that are attempted to be handled over Twitter that really should be done over the phone, uh, particularly long, complex travel arrangements or, or issues that cannot be resolved with a simple uh, back and forth on Twitter. And hopefully the reps have the ability to move to the phone when these issues arise. In any case, it's nice to see the airlines join the 21st century and engage their customers where customers are engaging them. This is Phone Boy reporting for the Daily Tech News Show today from lovely Tel Aviv, Israel. Hey, Tom, it's Darren Kitchen from Hack 5, and I am on my way up the Pacific Coast Highway because every now and then hackers need to unplug. And I am so energized from a Hack 5 meetup that we had last Sunday, and it was just so great to get community together. And I was thinking about how we're so lucky that in the last eight years, have really risen from their solitary basements and built these spaces where we can all get together and get inspired and work. You know, visiting these hacker spaces has been one of the most rewarding parts of Hack5 to me. And so I know from Chat Realm that a lot of our listeners are interested in this stuff, you know, because hacking is more than just SQL injections and breaking open SSL. It encompasses robotics and home automation. And really, it's all about creativity and curiosity. So I'd like to plug hackerspaces.org. It's where I invite all of the curious listeners to go and find out where their local community gets together. And who knows, maybe it's in your own backyard. They're all super welcoming, especially to newbies. And anyway, I'm back to vacation. Uh, oh, and P.S. Heart bleed. OMG! Hi, this is Guillaume from Brussels, Belgium. Today I want to give you all a quick tip. If you're searching for a nice and simple Linux distro you want to set up for let's say your parents who are still using Windows XP and urgently need to upgrade, have them try Chromium OS. Chromium OS is the open source project behind the famous Chrome OS. It's all open source since it's based on Gentoo and Chromium. You can easily find instructions online on how to install it. And after it's done, you can add proprietary plugins to add support for Netflix, Flash and video files. Your parents shouldn't be too confused given how similar it is to Windows and how intuitive it is. Because you know, it's a browser. They know how to use a browser. And that's it. Your parents are free from proprietary software and from viruses, and Chromium OS should fit the needs of most parents. Hey everyone, Patrick here with a tech thought about Windows 8. Uh, basically, I was thinking about uh, the fact that Windows 8 has received so many updates and will be receiving an additional one uh, very soon with the return of the hailed and very missed uh, start menu, um, that it's now essentially the best of both worlds. It's got the interface that a lot of people were pining for, uh, the one from Windows 7, and all of the really good improvements from Windows 8. Uh, so I was wondering if the haters were still going to hate and declare to the world that Windows 8 is a terrible OS because now they have everything they've asked for. I think it's time to say that Windows 8 is awesome. What do you think? Hey Tom, Kincaid Babb from Dallas, Texas, proud patron. I wanted to provide a little feedback on the discussion over the last week regarding streaming set-top boxes, specifically the discussion about universal search and whether or not it was going to be a part of the uh, reported Google set-top box. And there was some discussion, or at least a suggestion, among one or more of your guests on both this show and on Core Killers that perhaps the Universal Search feature didn't exist presently, but it does. Uh, on my Roku 3, I have a Universal Search feature at least across all the apps that I have installed. So I can run a search for a movie, for example, and it will tell me if it's on Netflix, if it's on Amazon Prime, which I subscribe to, if it's on Vudu, uh, if it's on Crackle. And then I can choose. It will give me a price comparison and tell me how much it costs on each of those platforms. It knows that, for example, I'm an Amazon Prime member and it knows I can get certain content free there. Um, I love that it's the killer feature for me of the Roku 3 box. I do use, I've purchased the Amazon Fire TV and I like the interface, but I think it's just too locked down. And um, the lack of a universal search, at least presently, is a, a huge hurdle, I think, for, uh, for them to overcome. Anyway, uh, love the show. Keep up the good work. Thanks. 
Hello, Tom. This is John, text jab in the chat room when I'm in there, calling you about Kindle Fire TV, Amazon Fire TV rather, and Google Android TV coming up. Still not the killer boxes we need. I can work them fine, but having my mother understand how to put this thing on HDMI 2, then go searching around in the menus, and maybe even use voice search to find what she wants to watch, it's not the solution. We need simplistic control. Whatever happened to the days when we hooked our VCR up to channel 3 and hooked our cable box up to channel 4? That's how simple it needs to be. Now we've got fragmentation on what we hook up to our devices, how we access them, and how we use them. Somebody needs to simplify it. Somebody needs to appleify it. We need simple. That's my thoughts. Thank you. Hello, it's producer Jenny here, and I have the awesome responsibility today of thanking the Patreons. So thank you to 3,685 patrons who have given more than $10,500 per month to support Tom Merritt and the Daily Tech News Show, and also me. (laughs) And I just wanted to say a really quick word, which is that I've worked a lot of places in my life, and... The term audience engagement has been bandied about with abandon and desperation and analytics and metrics and Nielsen's and pixels and etc. But I've never really had as much fun hanging out with an audience until I met all of you. Because you guys take the term audience engagement and blow it to a million bits. You are the show. Whether you contribute with graphics or contribute in the subreddit or contribute a dollar a month or even more, you are what makes this show possible. You you are the engine that makes it run. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And now here are some picks of the day. Hey Tom, this is Tony from Daily Skew with a recommendation for you and your listeners. Voodoo. I recently started using uh, Voodoo, the uh, Walmart TV service, to convert my old DVDs to digital and I noticed that when you've got 10 or more DVDs you get a 50% off discount when converting to digital so if you don't feel like spending 20 bucks to get a blu-ray copy of a movie that you like and you've got a bunch of DVDs lying around you can use voodoo so uh, they don't have every movie like uh, for example Star Wars Indiana Jones They don't have those available for digital. But I, uh, for example, was able to convert uh, the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy, The Matrix, Jurassic Park, Megamind, really cool movies uh, to digital. Ten movies cost me $25, and when you first sign up, they give you another $2 discount. So it actually only cost me $23 to convert ten movies to high definition 1080p uh, so $20 per movie or $23 for 10 movies you make the call anyway that's my recommendation voodoo this is Tony from Daily Skew Bye bye the Gooseberry Project by the Blender Institute aims to be the world's first full length computer animated movie that is fully crowdfunded and openly produced by 12 teams from around the world. In order for the movie to be able to be made, the Blender Institute needs 10,000 people to subscribe to the Blender Cloud for 18 straight months at the price of 10 euros a month or 13 US dollars. People who stay on for the full 18 months will get their name in the credits and of course will have the satisfaction and knowledge knowing that they help produce a free culture movie. If you're a fan of the iPhone app Zombies Run, Six to Start mentions in a blog post that the next release of their app, named Zombies Run 3, will be released in the next couple days on both Apple's App Store and the Google Play Store simultaneously. It will come with a few free missions from the next season, as well as an in-app purchase for the remainder of the season. If you are struggling to get back into your daily workout routine for spring, you should give this app a try. I heard that cardio is key in the zombie apocalypse. 
And you can find all of our picks at dailytechnewsshow.com slash picks. Thanks for those picks. Well, that is it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for not only your support of the show with, with donations, with RSS feeds, with images, with all of these things that you do to help make the show possible, but by being the host of the show today. Thanks for filling in for me. Really, really, really appreciate it. Uh, big, big round of applause for everybody that submitted stuff today. And don't forget, folks, uh, you have a voice in what stories we cover every single day at our subreddit, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Get in there, submit some links, vote some stuff up, vote some stuff down. Let me know what you're interested in hearing. It helps me put together. It's not a direct democracy. I don't just take that list and use it, but it's in essential in figuring out what balance to strike and what things we cover. So get in there and do it, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Also, you can email us. Our email address feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Give us a call, 512-59-DAILY. It's 512-593-2459. You can listen to the show live when it's live, unlike today, mobile.alphageekradio.com. We'll be back and live tomorrow and on Monday at the regular time. And, of course, our website is dailytechnewsshow.com. Tomorrow's show will be live earlier in the day. It will be at 11.35 a.m. A.M. Pacific Time, uh, 2.35 p.m. Eastern Time, live from my alma mater, Greenville High School, with some students from Greenville High School as my guests. Talk to you then. This podcast is part of the Frog Pants Studios Network. For more information about this and other shows, visit frogpants.com. Audio program so good, it's like you're there.